This hearing will come to order. I want to welcome our witnesses and give you our thanks for testifying in front of the subcommittee today. General Spain, General Harris, welcome. Secretary Hunter, General Moore, welcome back. Uh, the budget request in front of us today was developed under the tight constraints of the Fiscal Responsibility Act. And some of your sister services were pushed into even more painful decisions than the Air Forces had to make, but we should not understate the difficulty of the trade-offs that have been made as you seek to modernize our forces to maintain our competitive edge with our most advanced adversaries while also maintaining necessary capabilities to respond to the threats that we face today. Perhaps most notable is that the Air Force has proposed to divest 250 aircraft in fiscal year 2025. Now, each of these proposed divestments has their own arguments for and against, but the broader picture is an Air Force that is shrinking. It's an Air Force that's foregoing the modernization of some legacy platforms, including F-15, F-16, and F-22, and directly divesting of others in order to invest in fielding a highly capable future force. The details of that highly capable future force and the threat that's driving you there are difficult to talk about in an unclassified setting. But what we can say is it will be a smaller but better force that is betting on future programs like the collaborative combat aircraft to reach the capacity that we will need. In addition to risks in these modernization plans themselves, we need to be upfront about the risks we're taking to get there. This year's budget requests proposes to retire 190 fighters and attack aircraft and procure only 60. That would be 130 fewer tactical aircraft for pilots to maintain proficiency and 130 fewer aircraft across which to spread those flight hours. That would also mean 130 fewer tactical aircraft to provide forces to meet the combatant commander's needs. And I see no reason to believe that these demands will fall for the foreseeable future. The merits of each proposed divestment must be considered separately. Not all aircraft are created equal, and those disparities only grow over decades of service life. We do understand the pressures the Air Force is under in the procurement account and elsewhere. Two of the three legs of the nuclear triad are under your umbrella, presenting an enormous fixed wedge in your plans, and of course the other side does get a vote. The most stressing threats don't lend themselves to incremental improvements, let alone standing still. Finally, the Air Force is embarking on a significant structure over overhaul to optimize itself for great power competition. The ambition is laudable, and I look forward to hearing your testimony on your vision for these efforts. And I look forward to hearing from our Air Force witnesses about the challenges and opportunities they face in modernizing the Air Force as we finish our scheduled hearings before we mark up the DOD authorization request. Anywhere we look in the Air Force program, we can see trade-offs that are being made in this request between strategy and budget. That includes with the Compass Call aircraft where we are replacing the current fleet with a smaller number of upgraded aircraft that won't be delivered until 2029. It also includes the Air Force's plan that would have truncated the HH-60 Whiskey program after fiscal year 2023. We need to hear how this reduction in the inventory objective for these forces would affect the Air Force's ability to rescue down pilots and air crew crews in future conflicts. I'm especially interested in hearing from the witnesses in how the Air Force plans to manage its multiple modernization programs in ways that expeditiously deliver the capabilities our warfighters need while protecting taxpayer dollars and avoiding too much risk to supporting combatant commander requirements. These should include the F-35 fighter, the B-21 bomber, the KC-46 tanker, and a new program to procure the Wedgetail aircraft to replace some E-3 airborne warning control systems or AWACS aircrafts, aircraft, also the uh, Advanced Battle Management System, or ABMS, which seeks to replace the EA JSTARS capability and is the Air Force's contribution to the Department of Defense's Joint 
All Domain Command and Control Program. The F-35, the core of the tactical air forces for the next few decades, has very real availability, affordability, and modernization challenges. It seems that the Air Force has recently made some hard decisions when it comes to the F-35 upgrade efforts, accepting a diminished capability in order to hopefully regain at least some momentum and avoid parking a large number of jets while the TR-3 software matures. It also sounds like the Air Force is doing some hard prioritization on Block 4 capabilities to bring the schedule back to where it needs to be. But whatever that capability set is going to be, it needs to be locked in soon so we understand what the demands are going to be on the engine and cooling system of the aircraft. Finally, we need to ensure that the subsequent Air Force investments yield the capabilities necessary to compete in any future conflicts, such as hypersonic missiles, the next generation air dominance fighter program, and others. We cannot ignore needs to recapitalize other existing capabilities that give our forces a competitive edge, such as our tanker forces. We will also take into account such lower visibility, but very important capabilities, such as the investments we need to make to ensure adequacy of training ranges for our fifth generation fighters and other next generation systems. I'm going to stop there uh, and get to our questions, but I want to thank our witnesses again for their service and before and for appearing before the committee. Uh, we will, yes, we will go to opening statements. Thank you very much. Um, and then when Senator Cotton arrives, we will give him the opportunity for an open, opening statement. So let me start with uh, General Spain. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Chairman Kelly. Ranking Member Cotton is not here uh, at this time, uh, but uh, Senator Ernst, thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony on Air Force modernization and review of the Department of the Air Force's FY25 presidential budget. As the Air Force continues to evolve to meet the needs of the current and future strategic environment, we must optimize how we organize, train, and equip Air Force forces, and we must do so in light of increasing global demands on the joint force. We've made great strides in our journey to transform the service into task-organized units of action with clearly defined force elements capable of meeting the worldwide demands of this strategic environment and its associated threats, but there's more to be done. Clarity in the structure of our force presentation and force generation models has allowed us to better articulate capability, capacity, operational readiness, and risk to both ourselves and to the joint force. As we continue on this path, fiscal reality means we must take measured risk even as we transform and modernize to meet those needs. The Air Force Force Generation Model, or AFRAGEN, in conjunction with a definable force presentation construct, has been successful in, pro in providing predictability for our service-retained forces, and continued improvement in this model is allowing our airmen to train and deploy as a team. As our force presentation model continues to evolve from the Air Expeditionary Wing construct, effective for the past couple of decades, to expeditionary air bases, to air task forces, and soon combat wings, we're shifting focus back to warfighting in a peer competitor environment. We'll carefully balance the risk in our garrison functions in order to prioritize focus on the combat mission and warfighting effectiveness. While we're in the midst of this important transition, the Air Force must continue to make deliberate and measured risk and current operational readiness in order to modernize our forces in line with the department's strategic readiness framework mentioned in the National Defense Strategy. We've made tough choices in order to prioritize investments in manpower, training, infrastructure, uh, flying hour program and weapon system sustainment, all aspects critical to enabling a ready force. DOD capabilities and those of peer, near peer, and potential adversaries are advancing at a rate that challenges our ability to provide relevant and realistic training. In order to maintain a qualitative advantage in multi-domain, full-spectrum employment, we're modernizing our training ranges and legacy airspace, and we've increased investments in virtual and synthetic training, acknowledging that while not a replacement for, for flying, certain factors will demand high-end training be accomplished in a synthetic or augmented environment. The Air Force remains committed to meeting the needs of the service and our airmen through continuous data-driven feedback. We've instituted multiple meaningful initiatives over the years regarding pilot production, and although it remains constrained, we are taking a holistic, ecosystem-wide approach to operational readiness and data accountability, which in turn has refined our pilot reporting information, awareness, and trust in the information to shape future initiatives, and we're starting to see positive indicators on those results. We appreciate the support of the committee on additional efforts to improve rated force management and pilot production, 
to include, in, to include improved retention initiatives. Uh, I thank you for your support and for the opportunity to testify today and look forward to the questions uh, and future collaboration with the committee. Thank you, General. Secretary Hunter. Well, thank you, Chairman Kelly, and, and also thanks to Ranking Member Cotton for having us here today to provide testimony on our fiscal year 2025 President's budget request for uh, Air Force modernization. As we testified uh, last year, uh, our operational imperatives work highlighted the challenges of integration and the importance of tight partnerships between the operational and acquisition communities in the Department of the Air Force and developing the necessary capabilities to deter and win in future conflicts. Uh, insights from that work directly informed and I would say shaped and enabled our ability to make the challenging trade-offs that we had to make on our 2025 budget request that you alluded to, Mr. Chairman, in your opening statement. And while those, uh, not all of those choices were ones that we would have necessarily preferred to be to have to make, uh, it was really essential that we had the analytical work and the underpinning of our operational imperatives to inform those choices, and it will continue to be so in future year budget requests, which are likely to be equally challenging uh, based on the current budget environment. It's also essential, as you alluded to, that we organize ourselves to do that work repeatedly as a normal functioning of the Air Force enterprise. And that really informed our effort to re-optimize for great power competition and make organizational changes so that the work that we did under operational imperatives is something that we do on a daily basis and not something that uh, is done by exception as it, as it was when we undertook initially uh, to study the operational imperatives. And we ask your, for your support for our budget request, uh, which really continues to focus and build upon the modernization required to meet our operational needs in the future. Uh, we remain steadfast in resourcing these top priorities, as well as others, such as nuclear modernization. Uh, but our resources, as you noted, were limited by the 2023 Fiscal Responsibility Act. The impacts of the, uh, the FRA, combined with uh, funding through continuing resolutions, which were extended this year, uh, and restrictions on our ability to retire older weapon systems uh, divert our ability to focus on delivering decisive combat power and, and put that capability at risk. Nothing could be more imperative than our need to receive timely authorization and appropriations of our fiscal year 25 budget request. Uh, as I noted, this request continues our modernization efforts, such as the development of the collaborative combat aircraft, the next generation air dominance uh, family of systems, KC-46, continuation of uninterrupted tanker recapitalization, our T-7 training aircraft, the E-7 wedge tail, uh, and the critical munitions uh, that are essential to our future operations. It also allows us to continue fielding platforms like the F-15EX, the F-15E pause, upgrades to the F-22 fighter, F-35 Block 4 capability, as well as sustaining our current fleet. I particularly want to highlight the CCA program as the exemplar of our efforts to develop and field new capabilities rapidly, affordability, and at scale, affordably and at scale. In April 2024, uh, the DAF exercised two option award contracts for CCA Increment 1 to Andrel and Journal Atomics to conduct detailed design, build, and test of production representative test articles. In fiscal year 25, we'll begin concept refinement for the next CC increment, as we also continue to explore international partnership participation with us on the CCA program. Uh, all of the work that you see happening under the CCA program has essentially uh, been initiated and taken forward uh, in the last two years. Uh, so this is a program that is going from initiation uh, to, uh, uh, to moving towards production on the most rapid uh, time scale I've ever seen for a system of this complexity. Since time is of the essence in capable development, we also want to thank the Congress and particularly the members of this subcommittee who were critical to the effort for providing the, uh, the department with quick start authority in section uh, 229 of the fiscal year 24 National Defense Authorization Act. Uh, Secretary Kendall, when he testified uh, to the committee, highlighted a program that was just approved through this quick start authority well, which will initiate work on providing C3 battle management for moving target indication at scale uh, that we are initiating and have initiated this year. This effort is an element of the operational imperatives funding request at fiscal year 25 uh, and is included in the budget request that you'll be considering uh, this year. And the Quick Start Authority allowed us to begin that work in this year and not wait for next year's appropriation. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify and we look forward to working uh, with Congress, industry, and uh, the communities that support us to defend the nation.
Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, General Harris. Chairman Kelly and Ranking Member Cotton. More importantly, I really do appreciate the opportunity to come and talk to you about our, our uh, modernization efforts in the Air Force. We know that your support is vital to not only our Air Force, but our airmen as we go forward and develop concepts and capabilities to confront our toughest challenges. Our current warfighting advantages are actively being tested in both traditional and non-traditional ways, and, are and also our adversaries are determined to contest our activities in all domains of warfare. Success in the future operating environment will require some different capabilities. Perhaps more importantly, winning will require new level of integration across the Air Force and the Joint Force as advantages are becoming more relative and increasingly transient. We are demonstrating the resolve to rapidly adapt and effectively compete, and we see that today in PACAF, USAFE, as well as CENTCOM. We're transforming concepts, capabilities, and organizational design to evolve the Air Force at a rate that will ensure our warfighting advantage. However, today, our Air Force is out of balance. Our operational imperative efforts and future force design analysis highlight several strategic areas of modernization that must be addressed. A modernization that moves away from platform-centric views to a threat-informed and systems-focused approach to deliver the right effects. I'm really referring to the Integrated Capabilities Command of our GPC effort. The threat environment is complex and dynamic as it's ever been. What worked well before may not well work well in the future. This is why the United States Air Force must continue to aggressively modernize. We cannot scale with our adversaries in terms of capacity alone. Instead, we must develop the right balance of integrated capabilities to maintain an operational advantage to deter adversaries. This requires us to transition to a force that can generate effects from longer range with sufficient mass through a tailored mix of new and existing and maybe even modified capabilities to shape the battle space for the joint force. Our investments in the FY25 budget continue to build on the work to modernize and rebalance the force, as I've mentioned. We're making considerable progress across areas such as kill chains, multi-domain sensing grids, unmanned systems, but there is significantly more work to be done. We need your support now more than ever to rebalance that force for a credible deterrence and, if needed, to win in future conflict. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak to you today, and I look forward to answering any of the questions you may have. Thank you, General. Uh, General Moore. Thank you, Chairman Kelly, Ranking Member uh, Cotton, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. It's an honor to be able to testify today on the Air Force's uh, defense authorization request for FY25. Uh, on behalf of the department, thank you both, uh, as well as the members of the committee, for your continued leadership and your unwavering support of the United States military. Today, we are in the midst of a difficult transition from a legacy force uh, to one built to deter Chinese aggression and win against any peer competitor. FY25 presents another opportunity for the Department of the Air Force and the Congress to work together to remain the world's preeminent power projection force. Through this partnership, we have made substantial steps towards achieving the force the nation needs, but we have much more work to do. Our most valuable resources, manpower, money, and time, remain limited. We must be disciplined in our decisions and focus our investments on what we need most. The Air Force strategy is not to divest. The Air Force strategy is to modernize, but this strategy requires us to make some difficult choices. We do not want to get rid of airplanes, but in order to invest in modernized capabilities and most importantly, pivot our airmen from the past to the future, we have to stop funding things that do not measurably bring us closer to the goal. In our FY25 request, the Air Force remains focused on achieving a fighter force mix that provides a capable, sustainable, survivable, and affordable force that can operate across a range of mission sets. Most notably, our FY25 request seeks to preserve our advances in modernization while shaping future investments around long-range kill chains and the elements that support them. This contribution to the joint force is central to our ability to deter and, if necessary, defeat aggression. We continue to make significant progress towards closing key capability gaps, but the hard choices are not all behind us. We must consolidate the things we need that are relevant to the future fight and make them the most relevant that we can. We must remain united as a department and as a nation to successfully overcome barriers to change. We cannot fail in this endeavor. Can we keep more legacy aircraft? Yes. Can we increase today's readiness? Yes. Can we get after tomorrow's modernization? Yes. But we cannot do all of these things at once. 
particularly in light of reduced buying power as a result of the Fiscal Responsibility Act, plus the workforce supply chain and inflation issues which remain as a relic of COVID. We have to strategically spread risk over time. We have chosen a strategy that allows us to move past what is holding us back from being able to compete. But our adversaries are watching. We must act now to make difficult choices and show them our commitment. And time is not on our side. American lives and those of our allies and partners rely on our ability to deliver air power. We look forward to once again working with Congress to shape a lethal force that does exactly that and also efficiently and affordably provides the most capable air power for our nation. I'm honored to sit here today with Mr. Hunter, General Harris, and General Spain, and we look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, General. Senator Cotton. Thank you, Chairman. I apologize for my late arrival. I was at the ceremony to unveil the statue of Daisy Bates, the iconic civil rights leader of the Little Rock Nine in 1957, uh, which is the new statue that the state of Arkansas has chosen to place inside Statuary Hall. Um, in the interest of time and a great disappointment, I know to you all, I will enter my remarks into the record. I know you came here just to hear them. I am, I am very disappointed. So, thank you. Thank you, Senator Cotton. Uh, we'll start with uh, questions here. Um, I'm going to start with Secretary Hunter. Uh, Secretary Hunter, as you know, 60 to 80 percent of life cycle costs for the average airplane is sustainment. And at various times, there have been press reports that the Air Force leadership is wondering whether you can afford to buy all 1,763 F-35s um, and pay for the life cycle costs at the same time. Some estimates had the uh, flying hour costs at $39,000 an hour. F-35 is the most advanced uh, weapon system in the world. I got to experience this uh, just in January when I flew an F-16 against an F-35 and uh, was um, very impressed with some of the F-35's capabilities. It's critical, um, this aircraft's critical to us maintaining our competitive edge over our near peer adversaries. So Secretary Hunter, could you tell us what avenues the Air Force is investigating for reducing the life cycle costs of the F-35 so that we can afford to operate the airplanes uh, in the numbers that we need? And what progress have you made in reducing the operating and support costs? Well, we work in very close concert with the F-35 Joint Program Office uh, and with the Navy to uh, Department of the Navy uh, to really get after the issue of F-35 sustainment costs. Uh, we have a number of initiatives that we've been working on, uh, some of which are been accelerated by the uh, National Defense Authorization Provision Section 142 direction to us to examine how we better leverage the, the enterprise sustainment capabilities of the services, Navy and Air Force, uh, to, uh, to, to more affordably sustain that aircraft. That is something that the Air Force is committed to. We're putting together a transition team uh, to help us tackle some of those challenges. The biggest one that the Air Force is focused on initially is uh, the supply chain management part of the problem. We do a supply chain management for a lot of large air fleets, a lot of large international air fleets, F-16 being an example. Uh, and we believe that there are savings to be had by leveraging some of our enterprise uh, sustainment capabilities in addition to uh, the, the capabilities that Lockheed brings to the table uh, and to the partnership. Mr. Secretary, can you talk a little bit about the F-135 engine and some of the challenges? I know the Air Force has faced uh, turbine blade issues, um, also uh, cooling you know, problems that's uh, tied to the expansion of capability. But how does, is the, is the engine one of the biggest components in trying to bring down the life cycle cost? Well, it is a huge component of life cycle cost. So you're absolutely right about that. Uh, and when I first came into this job, we had huge issues of uh, engines not being available uh, because of the turbine issue that you talked about. Uh, and we had power modules that were just uh, not functioning, had to be returned to the depot for repairs, a lot of engines, uh, a lot of aircraft sitting without engines. We have largely worked through that issue, thanks to the incredible work of the folks at, uh, the, at Tinker uh, and the Air Logistics Center there in close partnership with Pratt & Whitney. It was a team effort. Uh, to really get through that issue. So now we were able to generate the number of power modules that it takes to keep engines uh, in our fleet. There is a longer term issue as, it, as you identified with, uh, because of the, 
the need for uh, power for all of the systems of the F-35 that longer term, we are working through the life cycle uh, of, of the F-135 engine faster than was projected. Uh, and that has led us to make an investment uh, in the ECU uh, upgrade to the F-135 engine uh, to get after restoring uh, the full lifetime of the engine. And what's the uh, current goal for flight hour per flight hour costs that you're trying to get to from $39,000 an hour? Uh, I'd have to do some translation. So we articulate that goal uh, formally in the Air Force as a cost per tail per year uh, of $6.8 million, which is the goal that we've established. Uh, we're actually not far from that goal today. So, And how many hours does that give you? I'd have to go back and look. I believe it's uh, 180. 180. Okay, that's $37,000 per flight hour. That's still incredibly you know, high. I can't imagine a, uh, another, I'm not sure what the F-22 is, but I can't imagine it's as high as 39,000. Go ahead, General. So the F-22s in particular, the Block 20s, are in the neighborhood of $75,000 per hour. Wow. That's part of our challenge with those aircraft. Yeah, is it, it, uh, we will work. We will not stop trying to get that cost lower. But uh, from my perspective, it, it is not uncommon with what we're seeing in our other fleets what we're seeing right now with F-35. Right, thank you. That cost. Senator Cotton. I want to uh, explore uh, the topic of force design and department plans, General Harris. Uh, you mentioned in your opening statement that Air Force fighters are older than the other services with an average age of 26 years. Is that correct? I believe that was the uh, comment that was made, yes. So does that mean that sustainment costs are rising as the fleet ages and, and thus reducing funds that are available for modernization needs? So there's always a tension between the modernization and the readiness. And when you start putting upgrades onto them, how much can we do per tail per upgrade and still maintain pilot absorption? So that tension for readiness and modernization will still exist, yes. That sounds like a yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so how does the procurement of F-15EX, F-35, next generation air dominance manned fighters help you avoid that downward spiral of continued sustainment cost growth? So from a, from a force design aspect, what we do is we look at where do we need to be with respect to the threat into the future. That, uh, that mix of what is an inside force and what is an outside force is the balance that we're trying to maintain. That becomes the mix of the collaborative combat aircraft, the CCA, plus the F-15EXs. So if you think about the number of rails and the number of munitions you can put on the EX as an outside force working your way into the contested environment, there has to be a mix of both. When I mentioned in my comments about the force being out of balance, we have a great short-range uh, fighter game right now, but it's not the inside force that we need. What we need to do is pivot to a more uh, outside force with more rails, the F-15EX uh, and the like. So. From a force design standpoint, that's how I would answer the question. I think if there's an operational piece, I would pass it off to General Spain or General Moore as far um, as the cost per tail. Before, before that, how important is the next generation air dominance manned fighter to your future force design? So the next generation uh, air dominance family of systems is critical to what we do. And what I mean by that is the technologies that are being developed within that portfolio and, and where we're going with, with, the, entire, uh, with the entire enterprise. Uh, it's feeding technologies and it's helped us create s and and other areas that we're leveraging to put into to other platforms and weapon systems. I, I mentioned the man fighter. You talked about the family of systems. Do you, can you speak directly to the man fighter? Uh, I cannot, Sorry, Secretary my, Hunter. I want to look, look like on, you want to jump in, Mr. On that one. Uh, so that is, so for our FY25 budget request, we are requesting significant funds for that, uh, the, the crewed fighter uh, part of the NGAD family of systems, and there are all the members of the family are leveraging the technology work General Harris described. But yeah, we have requested significant funds in our FY25 budget request to move to the next phase of uh, of the program when it comes to the crude fighter. What's your current assessment of whether the United States Air Force or the PLA Air Force will, will first field a sixth generation manned fighter? Uh, my assessment would be that it would be the United States, but it is uh, the, the term pacing threat uh, is, I think, a very apt term because it is a, it is a race. Okay. Uh, General Spain, every year the committee seems to receive a request to reduce the number of manned fighters. How many fighters do you need to do your mission? Thanks, Senator. Uh, I think the part of the last question hints at the answer to this question, and the idea 
is that we're uh, reducing the number of actual aircraft fielded uh, in order to bring on new capabilities that are exponentially greater than, uh, than those we're divesting. Uh, the, there are limits to how much we're able to divest that, uh, that, we, have, uh, that we adhere to, and the, we continue to work with the Secretary of Defense and uh, the combatant commands and the uh, global force management process to ensure that the fighter fleet that we have uh, meets the needs uh, of, the, of the force. Do you have an answer? I mean, do you have a direct or specific answer about how many fighters you need? I, I can take that for the record, sir, but uh, there's not a specific number of fighters. I, I can say that uh, uh, between we retain between 1,900 and 2,000 fighters currently. That's the, the range that we're in. Uh, that, that is sufficient to meet today's commitments, and that will be sufficient to continue to meet uh, the commitments going forward. Okay. Uh, if the Air Force shuffles combat-capable aircraft, craft like the F-15E and the F-22 into training roles due to divestments, how is that going to affect your current combat capacity? Well, we're, so, we're still working through the details of how that would actually play out if that, uh, if that were to occur. Uh, but the bottom line is uh, combat-capable aircraft are, uh, would be used for training, just like uh, a, a training uh, tailored aircraft. Uh, however, um, in uh, uh, extremis, if they were needed to go into a combat, if they were uh, not uh, T-coded tails, then we'd be able to use them for combat uh, missions if necessary. Okay. Well, this is one of the concerns that I stated in my, that I would have stated in my opening statement. I'm sure you're all going to go read the record about it tonight, is that I, I just don't think we're buying enough stuff fast enough, uh, whether it's fighters or the E-7 or munitions. Um, I may have more on that later. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Secretary Hunter, General Moore, um, to continue the conversation, uh, uh, I, I wanted to chat with you a little bit on KC-135 recapitalization. I'm aware of the significant risks that the Air Force faces in its ability to sustain and project the joint force across the globe with an aging aerial refueling fleet. Uh, it is vital and incumbent on the Air Force to provide the Air National Guard with the requisite equipment to support its air, aerial refueling mission. I want to ensure that there is transparency in the decision-making process for the MOB-7 selection of the KC-46 and a plan for what comes next for the remaining Air National Guard with legacy aircraft. Um, can you, uh, uh, Secretary Hunter or General Moore, can you provide insight into how Air National Guard units that have an existing association with an active duty air wing will be scored on the basis of that association during the MOB-7 selection process? And if units won't be scored on their association with an active duty air wing, why did the Air Force not include this in the basing criteria for MOB-7? And was this scoring included in the basing criteria for MOBs 1 through 6? So, Senator, I, I uh, MOBs 1 through 6 all included uh, an active associate where they went to guard units. MOB 7 is not intended to include an active Why? associate necessarily. Uh, that's, that's just not what we decided to do with MOB 7. So there is... But, but, but why, why did you decide to take that criteria out when it was in the previous six MOBs? So we've, 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 we feel like we have uh, the capacity... Uh, with the first six that, that we needed to have in the KC-46 as we transition forward past MOB-8 and into the future. Uh, we'll look at this again, but, but for MOB-7, we elected not to include, uh, we elected not to include an active associate. With the possibility of that coming, we did include scoring criteria for the facilities that go along with an active associate in the event that that becomes an additive mission in the future, but it is the, the presence of the active associate itself is not a part of the scoring criteria for MOB-7. For the units that compete but aren't selected for MOB-7, we intend to replace every KC-135 one for one. Uh, eventually, it will take us some time to do that, but our intent is to replace all of the KC-135s with, uh, with a, some form of a new tanker. Uh, as, as you alluded to, and you, you well know, I'm not telling you anything that you haven't been watching for quite some time, the youngest KC-135 that we own was made in 1964. And so continuous recapitalization of the KC-135s is the top priority in the air refueling portfolio. And we've, we have the ability to, to complete the KC-46 buy. Um, that will take us to 183, and then beyond that, we'll continue uh, recapitalizing the KC-135s as the budget top line permits. But our intent is to recapitalize all of them. Okay. Are we committed to continue to work with me on this? Yes, ma'am, of course. Yes, Thank you. 
Over the last year, I've discussed with Air Force leadership the importance of having a force design plan, a, a strategic document, to guide the Air Force's modernization efforts. And I want to thank you and just say how pleased I am that the Air Force has worked with me this past year on creating a force design process. And thank you for being very responsive to that. Um, as you continue to refine this process and finalize your force design plan, I do want to offer my continued support um, and willingness to engage in those planning discuss discussions. Pivoting the conversation to the Indo-Pacific, I am concerned about the unique challenges in the region and that the region will have on the Air Force's aeromedical evacuation and aerial refueling capabilities. The Air Force needs to coordinate and integrate modernization efforts with Indo-PACOM and TRANSCOM to support a fight tonight mission and force design in force design planning. General Spain, General Harris, and General Moore, as you continue to develop the force design for the Air Force, how are you working with combatant commands like Indo-PACOM, like TRANSCOM, uh, and TRANSCOM, sorry, uh, to ensure our current and future operational requirements like aerial refueling and aeromedical evacuation are incorporated into the force design. And I ask about this capability specifically because they are contingent on the Air Force's investments in the next generation air refueling systems and the KC-135 recapitalization. Senator Duckworth, thank you for the question. And also thank you for your continued support with this and working with us on the force design. So since the last time we've met, uh, we've continued work on the force design. We now have the framework of it, which is the strategic context and where we're looking out into 2030, 2035. We also have from the Intel community an assessment of that same timeline and what we think. And what that does for us is it allows us to do an assessment. And these are the gaps and the holes that we have within the Air Force. Some of it could be a clean sheet, new aircraft. Some of it is modifications that we need to make to existing platforms. And we have a list of that as well. Uh, we're happy to go over that at any time with you. But the other parts of this that we continue to develop are the, uh, the, the force structure pieces of it. And by the end of June, we should have the manpower piece. So it's not good enough just to have the capability come and arrive, but you need the manpower to meet up at the same time as well. So those are the next two efforts, and that should be done by June. And we're happy to circle back with you and have a, a meeting and keep working with you and your staff. But as far as the COCOM inputs on this one, I would say that the, the framework of the force design has three components. It is homeland defense, strategic deterrence, and power projection. And from that, we use the O plan. So this is the COCOM's input to that to make sure that we're adhering to what NORTHCOM needs, uh, what STRATCOM needs, and what all the other combatant commands need under the power projection platform piece of this. So that is one way that we do it. The second way is we work through our components, so PACAF, USAFE, mm -hmm. to make sure that we're hearing their requirements and putting that into the force design. We're just finishing up a war game this week to take a, a look at what that force structure looks like to see if it's going to meet the needs of the future threat environment that the intel community has laid out. Thank you. Um, I do. Can I just read out a question for the record uh, um, for Secretary Hunter and General Moore? I am concerned about the Air Force's operating and contested environment and the need to resource Air Mobility Command. Can, um, and this is just for the record. Can you explain how the new Integrated Capabilities Command will allow the Air Force and Air Mobility Command to prioritize modernization investments and resourcing decisions? And how much input will combatant commands like TRANSCOM have in these decisions? And just get that back to me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Duckworth. Senator Ernst. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, gentlemen, for being here today. And, and uh, you know, obviously the Air Force is transforming to meet the needs of the NDS um, and of great power competition. And as part of the transition, the Air Force has been engaged in a series of open and closed tabletop exercises to get ready for that China challenge. And so one of the key recommendations has been the urgent need to improve the resiliency of our air assets. So Secretary Hunter, if I could start with you, um, how does the Air Force plan to prioritize um, when it comes to the construction and upgrade of hardened bases in response to some of these evolving challenges? Yeah, that was a huge part of our uh, operational imperative five uh, effort was to understand what are the bases that are most in need of hardening and how do we prioritize and rank among them. So there's significant funds that were included in our 24 budget request and also in our 25 budget request to procure equipment, supplies, uh, construction, material, and everything that's required to do that work. Uh, and then the issue is how do we prioritize where those materials and supplies then go. Uh, so that's been a huge part of our OI-5 uh, efforts in close coordination with uh, Air Combat Command uh, and the uh, and the air uh, the part the Air Force components that General Harris just referenced, right? The PACAF and others as to how we deploy those uh, those assets. 
Mm -hmm. And I I just want to make the statement, of course, uh, we do have um, a KC-135 tanker unit uh, in the Iowa Air Guard. And so I just want to remind everyone, not only do we see needs for the future in our active duty forces, but please don't forget about our reserve and guard forces and their needs as well. The concern that we have in Sioux City with that squadron is that they were promised by the Air Force years ago that uh, the Air Force would pay for the runway to accommodate these 135 tankers. That has not happened. Um, we divested uh, fighter jets. We took on the tankers. The Air Force has not made those improvements to the runway. And we are very concerned that when KC-46s roll around, we will not be able to accommodate and we will lose that mission. Um, so the Iowa Guard continues to give and give and give, and yet we haven't received what the Air Force has promised. So I understand the need to move forward and harden um, structures in the future, but let's make sure we take care of the commitments that have already been made as well. Um, so thank you. That was just an aside. I'm fighting for my Iowa <laughs> Air Guard. Um, so uh, then... Uh, as well, let's move on to modernization. So on uh, the 13th of April, I think we all witnessed in horror uh, the launch of over 350 missiles and drones at Israel from Iran. And fortunately, a lot of the threats were neutralized um, due to the Israeli defense capabilities, uh, which included the F-15E. And General Moore, the Air Force currently plans to divest those Strike Eagles, over 100 of those, uh, in order to modernize the Air Force. And uh, what are we doing to make sure there is no capability gap? Yes, ma'am. So uh, we, we are very proud of what happened uh, as, mm -hmm. as Iran took on uh, multiple countries' air forces. Uh, first of all, I would say that the command and control that went behind that, all of the things that are a part of that system, not just the aircraft and the pilots, mm -hmm. the munitions, command and control, there were no friendly fire incidents in that in a very, very busy and very, very compressed airspace. Mm -hmm. That is amazing. And not to take anything away from what happened that night, but there was no air-to-air to, air to air threat. There was no ground-to-air threat, and Iran is not a peer adversary. So those aircraft did not have to enter a highly contested environment, and they did not compete with an air force that was specifically designed to defeat them. China is a peer adversary. Iran is not. Mm -hmm. Those aircraft average 33 years old, and as I, said, as I said at the beginning, our strategy is not to divest aircraft. That's not the goal. However, we do see the need to modernize aggressively, and in order to do that, we need to transition airmen as well as resources to the future. Mm -hmm. So we are very proud of what happened uh, in, in Israel, uh, but those aircraft were not in a highly contested environment and they were not taking on a peer adversary. Yeah, and I, I do appreciate the approach you are, are taking. Um, I know we have to assume some prudent risk in doing this. So um, as long as the Air Force has a plan to close any gap that might exist out there, you know, we, we trust that you are covering down on that. So um, thank you for that. And uh, I do have a couple more questions. I'll submit those for the record. Um, but thank you, gentlemen, very much for being here today. Appreciate it. Thank you. Senator Peters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for uh, your testimony here today, and thank you for all the work you do for our country uh, every day. We appreciate that. Uh, General Spain, uh, the, I would argue that the, uh, the Air Force uh, needs to continue to think outside uh, of the box about potential KC-46 uh, refueling tanker and the uh, collaborative combat aircraft uh, teaming and the potential that that offers. Uh, I was particularly pleased uh, during uh, his uh, SAS testimony last month when General uh, Alvin shared that the Air Force uh, now is exploring uh, using KC-46s as a communications node uh, with these efforts, potentially enabling uh, their use as an airborne battle management platform uh, for future uh, CCAs. So my question for you, sir, is, is how is the Air Force working to advance uh, expanded KC-46 communication capabilities? And simultaneously, how can the Air Force begin to plan for potential CCA KC-46 interoperability? Uh, yeah, thank you, Senator. I think operationally what I'll, I'll talk to is uh, the need to connect uh, the mobility fleet broadly uh, and gain situational, situational awareness within those platforms to help out in the battlefield. One of the things that we're learning uh, as we experiment with 
uh, agile uh, expeditionary comm capabilities is that the battle management function um, in the future could be uh, done really from any platform and not uh, an airborne early warning platform solely. And so for the acquisition uh, details, I'll kick it to Mr. Hunter, but from an operational perspective, getting the flexibility uh, in the evolution of command and control down the road would be very beneficial to the joint force and, and coalition force. Yeah, great. Secretary Hunter. One of the great things that happened last year was our mobility uh, guardian exercise in which we uh, did some uh, relatively low cost upgrades to enable some additional comms with the uh, fleet, the, the air refueling fleet that participated in that exercise uh, and demonstrated quite a bit of payoff, payback mm -hmm. operationally for uh, for those investments. So that's something that we're absolutely looking at. How do we take that uh, that lesson learned and that approach and apply that across our fleets? Uh, KC-46 starts ahead. KC-135 is an older platform, uh, uh, has a little bit farther to go, but there is a need for some modernization in both cases uh, and make that part of our approach. And ultimately, what we characterize as our um, NGAS, the Next Generation Air Fueling System, uh, it, it is designed uh, in principle like our NGAT approach, family of systems, technologies developed under that programmatic approach, which actually can be utilized across the broader fleet, not just in the new aircraft that would be being procured uh, as part of a modernization program. So those are threads, all of which are currently in work uh, to expand the comms capability of the air fueling fleet. Yeah, great. Very good. Uh, General uh, Spain Harris, uh, this question is for you. Uh, CCAs are, will require uh, comprehensive and integrated uh, training, certainly, uh, for all Air Force components, including uh, the Air National uh, Guard. Uh, training should be planned and executed by all components to uh, foster uh, uniformity in skills, uh, tactics, and most importantly, uh, readiness uh, for the, the total uh, Air Force. Uh, as Air Force uh, integrates CCAs, um, it is crucial, I would argue, to ensure that our training programs are collaborative, uh, as the aircrafts themselves. And so my question for both of you is, uh, currently, how does the Air Force integrate new platforms across the total force, including fielding, training, and maintenance? And, and does the Air Force plan on adopting a similar model to what you have used when it comes to CCAs? So I'll start with the, uh, first off, thank you for the question. The way that we, uh, the way that we're going to onboard CCAs, uh, I, I don't think it's going to be too drastically different from the way that we've seen onboarding of other aircraft, uh, with the exception of uh, bringing something out into an experimental operations unit. Uh, something we haven't done before is having the aircraft fly with other unmanned aircraft in close proximity to it. So there's going to be some learning that that's baked into this. Uh, using AETC uh, is going to be part of this journey with us. There's ways that as we're, code, as we're learning through tactics, techniques, and procedures, things that we want to institute within the schoolhouse so when we bring new pilots on, they become familiar with how to operate with these unmanned systems. So it's going to be the pairing and the learning plus the expeditionary or uh, the, uh, the experimental operations unit that we can actually use to help harness some of this learning. Elmo? Senator, uh, from a training perspective and operational perspective, I'd say that the, 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 uh, uh, the benefit and the value that is uh, very clear by outfitting the total force with similar capabilities in particular mission areas is, is clear across, the, across of all of our fleets. Uh, and, this would, and CCAs would be no different. We would intend to um, ensure that those units, uh, whether active or reserve component, have the same capabilities to operate for the joint force in any fight with uh, with our allies and uh, partners, and uh, on behalf of the Secretary of Defense or a combatant commander in any theater, uh, regardless of the affiliation. And so we would ensure that there's a baseline comment across uh, the total force. Great, wonderful. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Mullen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, General Harris, just you know. Looking at you guys as reoptimizing, re um, you know, for the the future powers ahead, right? Uh, you guys are making some changes to the training processes for your pilots, which is is great. You know, we got new platforms, new technology, we got to work on. Uh, but as you know, Altus uh, Air Force Base in Oklahoma and Vance Air Force Base, where Vance is one of the, the top pilot pilot training centers in in the country. Where are we at with changing those programs there, and where does it leave the Air Force bases? Uh, when you start talking about what's the future of Vance and what's the future of Altus in their current mission? 
So I don't, I don't see the current missions changing. I, what I do see changing is as we look to reframe what a unit of action is and how we deploy, uh, that will be different. And, and this, this is where we get into the in-place uh, in combat wings or the different types of combat wings that might be out there. There's still foundational things that we need to do within our Air Force that Air Education and Training Command does for us today. Uh, the changes that we're talking about under great power competition and the reoptimization for this really are aligning things like the accessions part of it or onboarding of the warrant officers and, and the other things that our chief has talked about in previous testimonies. As far as the bases and the missions and the roles and functions, uh, specifically the institutional ones that are aligned to that, I, I don't see those changing. Well, I, I, in Vance, I have a concern because you're changing a lot of your flight time to simulators, which is at first, to be quite frank with you, General Harris, I was thinking, how are you taking someone with the actual flight time to a simulator? And then your instructors down there actually spent time with me and said, listen, we can put these pilots now in situations where they might have a 5% survivability rate um, because of a mechanical error. We can put it in, in the simulator over and over and over and over again. And we're going to see an increase of that survivability rate, in which I thought, okay, I totally understand that now, right? I'm not a video game guy at all. I didn't ever even won Mario Brothers back, way back when on Nintendo. And so that's just not my world. But when you start looking at, at the simulators and the way they're training, I, I totally understand it. But some of the simulators you guys have set up at Vance is literally in a warehouse. I, I was in there in the middle of summer, and uh, wow. I mean, this warehouse was 100 degrees all day long, if not over. And these, the, the, these future pilots are set in these simulators for hours. And so I don't see the infrastructure meeting where... You guys are moving towards, you're just taking them and putting stuff there, and I don't see the investment. I definitely don't see it when you're going to your budget that the Air Force put out. I didn't see anything new for Vance to be able to meet the new training that you guys are, are asking them to do, except using old infrastructure. So can you speak of that? Uh, Senator, I can speak to part of that. So uh, in terms of great power competition and the reoptimization, right. you, you won't see uh, money associated with any of the efforts that we're making into this one. Uh, a lot, large part of that is the work is ongoing and we're still uncovering what, what it's going to take to be able to do this effectively. And FSRM and some of these facilities uh, will be one of them. The joint simulation environment is another piece of this. But it also speaks to a broader piece of, of the ranges in general and how we train and practice every day and the modernization that's going to need to, to keep all those together. Well, Go ahead, General. Senator, let me. Let, I, I'm not. I'm not tracking the the issue that you're talking about, Advance. But I understand the concern. Let us take this yeah. for the record and, well, and come back to you and it, give you a, a more cogent discussion on this. And, and let me uh, let me explain this one too. I'd love to invite you guys there. We take a lot of pride in Vance, and it is it's something that the community is a thousand percent behind. It's something that the state's behind. Uh, we love the fact that there's more pilots trained there than any place in in the country. We want to keep that there. So. With that being said, I, it's, I'm a, I'm a hands-on type of guy. I want to see it. So um, we would love to make that invite. I will personally make sure I, have, I change my schedule to fit your all schedule if anybody wants to come down there and, and put eyes on it. Yes, right. sir. We, we would love to do that. I'm, I'm not tracking this particular issue, okay. but we'll take it for the record. They're not complaining to me. I picked it up. Yes, sir. They've never brought it to me and said, hey, we need to look at this. I just thought if we're talking about retaining the best, Sometimes conditions do matter. Yes, sir. Fair. Uh, real quick before I run out of time, and I, I hated to spend so much time on that, but uh, Secretary Hunter, um, we got a problem at Tinker with providing our mission when we have an overrun of the E-7s while we're phasing out the E-3s. And I've brought this up multiple times, and we get answers that go all over the place on how we're going to actually phase out the E-3s when we can't deliver the E-7s on time and still be mission capable. We talk about utilizing space assets, which that's a possibility, but what are we actually going to do to make sure the mission that Tinker does, and we know Tinker provides a very vital role to us, and especially in a time of conflict, if we go into an eventual fight, they're going to be our eyes and our ears, and yet we're not going to have the platforms to provide the mission. What's our actual plan? Are we going to plan on just keeping some of the E3s around because they're phasing out pretty quick before we get the E7s? So our plan is to have E7 as a replacement, and we are on contract with Boeing. But way behind uh, and, and, and we twice been, over budget. So we have been executing on the work. What we've been behind on is uh, we got a proposal from Boeing that was uh, roughly twice 
what the budgeted funding was. Funds that were budgeted based originally on information from Boeing about what the cost was going to be. I, I can tell you we have we have narrowed that gap uh, quite considerably uh, and to an area where I believe we will soon have an agreement that will be something that is affordable for the taxpayer, affordable for the Air Force, and we'll be able to uh, to definitize that contract with Boeing and know how that rapid prototyping program, which is what we're currently engaged in, uh, is going to work over the next several years. Then the issue, and where we have seen some changes in our plans that you're referencing accurately, is how do we move into production of those of those aircraft that we've taken through that prototyping process? Uh, and that is where there have been some delays, because not knowing that we had a design that was affordable, uh, we could not in good conscience budget for uh, production of an aircraft that we didn't yet have a, a design that we knew was going to work. Thanks. So we will be able to revisit the issue of what does the pace and tempo of E7 production uh, once we have that agreement reached with Boeing. Thank you. And, uh, General Moore's, I think, is wanting to weigh in on this, but I'm out of time. So, Chairman, it's, on, it's up to you. Oh, go ahead. Good. Yeah, sir, I, I, you said the E3 would be our eyes and ears. I think we all have to be honest about what the E3 actually provides. The physics of the E3 right. does not permit it to function in the highly contested environment. Nothing that we can do to upgrade the airplane will change a 10-second revisit rate. It won't change the range. It won't change the resolution, which allows it to see what we need. The mission computer in an E3 weighs 25,000 pounds. Mm -hmm. It is powered by TF-33 engines. We did an extensive amount of research in the B-52 upgrade program to determine how long those engines were sustainable. And there are some heroics that could get some of those engines past 2030, but for all intent and purposes, 2030 is the end of the road for the TF-33 engine. So we are working, as Mr. Hunter said, as quickly Perfect. as we can to bring the E-7 on, but the, but the E-3 is not a part of the fight in the highly contested environment. That doesn't mean it doesn't have use in other AORs and in other, other regions uh, Homeland Defense in particular, but it is not a part of the fight in the highly contested environment. Thank you. Appreciate it. Senator Blumenthal. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you all for being here. Thanks for your service. Um, Secretary Hunter, could you repeat for me the cost of flying the F-35? Did you say 180? That, I may be off I on think that. We were saying it's 180 flight hours, but it's uh, 6.8 million cost per tail per year. Uh, and then I think we were trying to translate that into a flying uh, flying hour cost, which we I think calculated was in the mid thirties. Mid thirty range, yeah. Um, is that a cost that our allies or the customers for this plane are going to be able to sustain? In other words, other nations that are buying the F thirty five are paying thirty thousand dollars an hour to simply train and and fly, and then there's the cost of modernization of them. I'm just wondering about the long-term viability in terms of our allies and partners with this plane. Yeah, I, you know, obviously they have smaller fleets. Uh, I have not heard any of the allies indicate to me that this is the, the operating cost of the F-35 is something that is significantly challenging their budgets beyond that it, we're all challenged, right, by these operating costs. But I've not heard any uh, of the partners talk about reducing their buy because of, uh, of the sustainment cost. It is something we continue to work to get after and to get down, and I think we will, and we are on a path. And I give General Schmidt a lot of credit for the effort that he and his team have put into that. Uh, but to the contrary, most of the partners and allies that I've talked to are talking about increasing their purchases of F-35. So... Uh, that suggests to me that they are finding it sustainable. Uh, well, that was my next question. What are the, what's the likelihood of reducing the $6.8 million per tail? I think we can reduce it. I think we are currently on track to do better than that, uh, and I would, like to do, I would like to do quite a bit better than that if, uh, if we can get there. Uh, and I think there are some good approaches, as I said, to potentially leverage some of our Air Force Enterprise sustainment tools, uh, some of which we're already doing. So the you know, the engine maintenance work that we do in partnership with Pratt & Whitney at Tinker uh, has, uh, has, really, uh, has, has really grown quite strong. Uh, and we can do similar type approaches on other subsystems of F-35 uh, in the Air Force, and the Navy uh, has many uh, that they are focused on as well. The uh, number of planes this year, the procurement this year, is going from 48 to 42. And uh, I understand your testimony that there are reasons for it, in part the modernization cost and quote unquote flexibility, I think is the word that you use to give Lockheed 
um, what is meant by flexibility to work, flexibility for Lockheed Martin to work through the issues related to Block 4 development and integration? What does that mean? Well, so the challenge we have specifically with the aircraft in our fiscal year 25 request is they are uh, of the variant that we are currently uh, working to do the Block 4 upgrades and working to deliver uh, the technology, the design, the hardware, the software to make a Block 4 variant of the F-35. So specifically the lot of aircraft that we are funding in fiscal year 25, uh, right now it's a, big, it's a huge challenge to Lockheed uh, to make all of that integration work in time to meet the jet that are being produced on the production line. Uh, and so a, a slightly smaller buy does, does add some uh, flexibility uh, for making sure that production schedule is going to work. Last year, when we spoke about the F-35 uh, procurement at the modernization hearing, you indicated that Russia's aggression in Ukraine has spurred numerous F-35 purchases by partners and allies, and I guess that, is, that trend is continuing. And you indicated that those purchases were sufficient to mitigate the, deep, the dip in procurement by uh, our military, and by extension to sustain the supplier base. Have you analyzed what the effects of the current trends and purchases by allies versus our own military is going to be on the supplier base? We have looked at uh, what the likelihood is based on, because obviously Air Force and uh, Department of Navy both uh, had some reductions in our fiscal year 25 aircraft purchases. It is uh, our current belief and understanding that uh, there will not be a disruption to the production rate at the factory uh, or that the FACOs are you know, primarily Fort Worth, but obviously some of the overseas ones, uh, that they would be able to continue at rate uh, even with these purchase levels from the United States services. And is that true of the, the parts and components, the supply chain that provide what's necessary to go into the plane? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Blumenthal. Uh, Secretary Hunter, I want to talk a little bit about um, <coughs> electronic warfare here for a moment. Uh, we're seeing in the war in Ukraine just how critical modern uh, EW is uh, on a modern battle battlefield. And certainly in a, any conflict with a near peer adversary, uh, we would be faced with a significant, challenging EW environment, hence the need for electronic warfare aircraft like the um, Compass Call. Um, the Compass Call airplane today, the EC-130, is being replaced over time with the EC-37. Uh, this program's uh, currently slated to replace the 14 EC-130s with 10 uh, EC-37s, uh, the first one being having been delivered already to, to Tucson, uh, the davis Mothin Air Force Base. Um, looks like the budget justification material shows that we're not going to get all 10 of the EC-37s until the end of um, the fight up in 2029. So, Secretary Hunter, what steps could we take right now to accelerate the delivery of EC-37s, understanding that this is an important capability uh, that we would need in any conflict with a near-peer adversary? Well, Senator, that program has been executed, again, in a relatively short time frame. Um, it was only a few years ago the decision was made to do the, uh, to do the, up the modernization, so the rehosting of the Compass Call combat system onto the EC-37 uh, platform. So uh, it, 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 I would hold it up as an exemplar of uh, some faster work in general uh, compared to some of our production programs. But to your point, right, to get all the way to fielding of a new capability, uh, you have to go through the aircraft production process, the modification process, and then fielding to the, to the unit. So I'll look to see what opportunities uh, we might have to save some time on that process. Uh, but uh, but the, the work that has been ongoing has not been without challenge, but it has happened uh, relatively on schedule. The equivalent airplane in the Navy was the uh, EA-6B 
Crowler and then later the EA-18 Growler. And each air wing typically had a squadron that had four aircraft. So with, um, you know, a dozen, let's say, dozen battle groups there, you had about 36 or more, 48, you know, airplanes. Um, I was surprised when I saw that the Air Force had just 14 um, electronic warfare airplanes and now going down to 10. So could you talk about, um, and, and Secretary Hunter, uh, maybe, you know, maybe one of the generals would be better equipped to answer this, but is 10 enough? I mean, it seemed to me when I heard this number there were gonna be 10 at Davis-Mothin, my initial question was, well, where are the other electronic warfare aircraft? And then I found out, well, there aren't any more. It's just the 10. Yeah, I, I, like you, I have a little bit of background on EA-6B from prior prior portion of my career. Uh, and so when I started uh, looking into the Compass Call program, I had to understand it's extremely different con ops uh, from the way in which EA-6, but I will take your suggestion and defer to General Moran. Yes, sir. So EA-37 EA is a highly capable aircraft, as you know, and it does some things that nobody, no other aircraft can do. It is far from the limit of the Air Force's electronic warfare capability. With the APG-85 on the F-35, the APG-82 on the F-15Es, uh, e -pause on the F-15Es, there are a variety of other electronic warfare uh, capabilities that we have in the fleet flying, and those many of those at the front edge, even in the highly contested environment. Beyond that, we've added a, a spectrum warfare wing uh, headquartered at Eglin with detachments uh, in other places in the, in the southeast with the specific intent of being able to characterize a signal ingested by the F-35 and turn that back around in an F-35 mission data file in a time that we could talk about in a, in a different forum. But suffice it to say, the, the quickness with which we intend to be able to do that is eye-watering. And so um, the EA-37, it, it, it is unique in what it does, but the Air Force's electronic warfare capability goes far beyond that aircraft. 10 aircraft was intended to provide two caps, Depending on what you believe about the breadth of the AOR that we might have to fight in, you could you could discern whether or not you think two caps would be enough. Uh, but that was the force sizing construct when the programmer record was set at ten. Yeah, thank you, General, and uh, thanks for the reminder. I, I have met with the commanding officer of the unit in Eglin, talking specifically in the skiff about how they turn that signal around and and how that can uh, benefit the warfighter. So, thank you for that response, Senator Cotton. Mr. Hunter, we've heard some talk about connectivity today, and in your written statement, you talk about the need to develop command and control systems for relevant contested missions. What's the fielding timeline of a resilient network for all these fighters, drones, and future systems to talk to each other? It's a rolling uh, timeline. So in terms of that first increment of capability, uh, probably in the 27 time frame, I would say if you were to talk about something at the level of a network capability, we have capabilities that are rolling out prior to that, and they're meaningful. Uh, so we have that for, for air defense already. We've already rolled out increments of capability of that system that are meaningful. But if you start talking about really being able to do entire mission threads at scale uh, anywhere in the world, uh, it's going to be another few years before we can really say we've rolled that out to the warfighter. All right. What's the impact of the Air Force's inability to certify basic network modernization today like Link 16 due to FAA roadblocks? Well, we have a lot of challenges in test when it comes to uh, FAA and their certification of Link 16. Uh, so that has impacted our acquisition programs like the F-22 and several others. Uh, and it's a, uh, it's a challenge that we share jointly with the Navy because some of our, many of our Link 16 capabilities are ones that the Navy is the program lead for and they run into the same challenges that we do. Okay. Um, General Moore, I want to turn my attention now to munitions. I noted $1 billion less in the Air Force missile procurement compared to last year, um, even though our munition stockpiles are not where they need to be. Uh, is the Air Force currently maximizing procurement of munitions? Senator, we are, we are close to maximizing procurement. Uh, we are in most of the, we're, what we're talking about here are the advanced munitions, really, the ones that pertain to the, to the highly contested environment. We're in most cases within single digits or in some cases within, within 20 or 24 uh, individual procurement units of maximizing procurement. What I think 
uh, is helpful for the future is thanks to the Congress in the 24 cycle, there was additional facilitization that allowed us to increase what the defense industrial base is able to procure. And so as that facilitization money takes effect, we will be able to increase procurement. We're, we, I wouldn't say that we're buying every single round that's available, but we're really close. Um, and the facilitization money that came in 24 will increase that capacity as we go through the fight. I'm sorry, I don't know what you mean by additional facilitization money. Building an additional line, putting together the facilities that it takes to build more of the of the same thing. And is the Air Force using multi-year procurement? I, well, I should say, I, I know you're using multi-year procurement for critical munitions. Um, can you buy more of these munitions with additional FY25 funds under that multi-year plan? There, there is some additional procurement that's possible, and if, if, if it's okay, we'll take the specific numbers and the specific dollars for the record and provide those back to you by, by individual item. Please do. Uh, General Harris, I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, unmanned aerial systems and counter unmanned aerial systems, CUAS, known by normal people as drones. Uh, what is the plan to defend our air bases from small drone attacks? Uh, after all, we had three troopers killed uh, in Jordan about three months ago from such an attack, and dozens of drones have overflown Langley Air Force Base uh, in the last six months. Thank you for the question. I, I, it's been almost a year since I was back from the desert <clears throat> where I was the deputy air component commander, and the drone problem was very much an everyday problem for us to deal with. Uh, for the program of record or what we have within the Air Force, the Ninja system onto this is the one that we use primarily, but it's a joint, uh, it's, it has to be a joint solution for this one. Uh, the Army has several systems that's out there, and quite frankly, it's the detection piece as far as, far as some of the smaller Group 1 and Group 2. And then for the Group 3 and 5, uh, as far as the Air Force doctrine and what we do, it's using some of our counter-air tactics and air-to-air -air munitions to be able to uh, mitigate the counter-UAS or the drone threat that's out there. Uh, some of the ones that you're seeing around Langley and the, and the like, uh, th these are things that we have to get after. We're putting resources to those. But for right now, some of these that use the, uh, the systems that I mentioned before, the Ninja system, uh, that's one. And we also have money that's in FY25 to start looking at some other systems that might be effective for this. Okay. What is the Air Force plan, if any, for low-cost, one-way, large drones like we've seen from adversaries in Russia and Iran and China? I guess by low cost, I mean numbers that have only one comma in them. Senator Is Cotton, plan? Yeah, if I can. You want to take that, General Spain? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, as was mentioned, the problem of counter UAS is a is a joint, really, and frankly, coalition problem. And uh, as we saw in Jordan, the, any loss of life is tragic, and, and we we uh, uh, you know, our hearts go out still to our Army brothers and sisters who are impacted by that. Uh, General Carrilla and General Grinkwich at the time, General France now, are implementing procedures in the theater to increase domain awareness, which is really uh, a key limitation in that theater. Uh, and the, the events in Langley uh, or in Virginia um, really speak to you know, the idea that the homeland is no longer a sanctuary and we have to continue to pay attention to it. The systems that we've been pushing forward uh, have largely gone to the most contested and kinetic theaters, uh, and we have still paid attention to systems in the Pacific or and, and or in Europe. But uh, but starting with the Pacific next year, we'll field some systems from uh, from a command and control perspective, from a sensing perspective, and from a, a non kinetic effector perspective. Uh, currently, what we're doing is we're nested under the Secretary of Defense's Tiger Team for counter UAS as a part of the service. Uh, and the Air Force has its own Tiger team at the half level uh, that has initiated uh, operations to support the wing commanders who are in the field today. If that, uh, if that problem becomes a factor and they don't have the relevant capabilities at their wings, uh, and Air Combat Command has uh, initiated its own Tiger team for uh, the below ma uh, major command level uh, to ensure that there's support for the commanders uh, to deal with this threat as well. It looks like I was going to say there's some more things we could share with you in a different form. Yeah, and, and I, I take all that, but some of these drones are not going to be for the little C UAS, right, but for the actual attack systems. Yeah, more we could share on that in a separate yeah. discussion. I just, I, I fear that, no, no one at this table, uh, but I fear that this Department of Defense is taking its name a bit too literally, um, and there's not enough thinking about how offense 
creates its own defense. Yeah, that's what I thought you were talking about. Like, what's the cheap offensive drone program? Uh, and I know we need to talk about that maybe in a different environment. Um, Secretary Hunter, I want to talk a little bit about the B B21, if you can give us an update. It was good to see it's going into low rate initial production. Um, obviously an essential capability that we need to get um, a lot of ordnance on target on time. Uh, any new developments, positive or, or negative, since last year? Well, we are in the flight test uh, program. The flight test program is proceeding well. Uh, it is doing what flight test programs are designed to do, which it is helping us learn about the unique characteristics of this platform, but in a very, uh, very effective way. So we are working our way through the test objectives that we have for the platform, uh, and uh, I'm encouraged with how that's progressing. There are some key points still to come this year, uh, and looking forward very much to talking to you uh, when we can come back with data on those efforts and let you know where we stand. But as of today, uh, good progress being made in the flight test program. Uh, we believe we are on track. Is this the first airplane that is would be considered to be fully digitally designed? Uh, well, uh, if you get to the people who are the true experts on this topic, there is always a point about, oh, this piece, was this really digital or how was this done? Uh, I would say it is the first aircraft where it is far more digital than not, uh, that you can say that we've taken into uh, where we are at this stage of production and moving towards fielding. And can you attribute the, uh, the, the, the timeline, and I imagine the relatively shorter timeline in in getting this airborne and starting flight tests to the fact that it was digitally designed? I think uh, it has helped us with uh, being as on track as we are to demonstrating that the aircraft that we have built to test is meeting our requirements. So I think higher fidelity and higher likelihood of success. Uh, there were other things that we did that contributed as well, uh, which is we had quite a bit of discipline in, in setting requirements and looking for mature technology. So a lot of good process things, uh, but digital has been a key enabler, uh, and especially on the software side. So this platform is somewhat unique in the maturity of the software that we had available when the aircraft came out of the factory. Uh, one capability that's critical for uh, the, the system is the LRSO. Could you give us an update on, on where we are? Is it on track? Uh, it is it is tracking well. Uh, the program is uh, definitely on track to meet its timelines and deliver to the warfighter need date. Uh, and uh, we are also doing well on cost for that program as well. Right. Thank you, um, Secretary Hunter. Uh, General Moore, uh, in my opening statement, I mentioned my concerns of the Air Force plans to truncate the HH-60 Whiskey program. It would leave the Air Force roughly 25% short of its original plan to modernize uh, the combat search and rescue capability of the fleet. So I worked to add uh, 10 aircraft last year to help alleviate the situation. So for General Moore or General Spain, um, why do you believe that truncating the HH-60 Whiskey program will be an acceptable risk? So, sir, the... The HH-60 Whiskey was designed and purchased for warfare in the desert. Over the distances that we see in the desert and with the threat profile that we see, it is highly effective in that AOR. It also does other good work. Uh, the HH-60 Whiskey will support manned space flight. It will support search and rescue inside the CONUS. Uh, but we have enough aircraft to do all of those missions. When you then translate to the highly contested environment, I don't know that any of us think that we want to be flying around the Pacific in a machine that refuels at 115 knots behind a C-130. It's just not the combat search and rescue machine that we need for the highly contested environment. So for what we do need and for the great work that the HHCC Whiskey can do, we have plenty of them. Uh, we do not need any additional aircraft to support combat search and rescue in the Pacific. Personnel recovery, as you know, certainly from, from many years of service, uh, is a service responsibility, and there are literally thousands of aircraft in the DOD that can perform personnel recovery. So you're planning on um, PJs out of a C-130, that kind of uh, rescue in Indo-PACOM? 
that that could be one of the options. Uh, I think that we will have to look at all of the all of the relevant options. I think CV22 could play a role here. Uh, I think there are several things that could be a part of personnel recovery, but for combat search and rescue, uh, doing that in the highly contested environment with HH60 whiskeys, that is probably that. I don't see that that is a path that leads us to success. And for what the HX60 whiskey can do, we have plenty. All, uh, another facet of this is, uh, as those aircraft continue to be added, in order for us to bring them into the Air Force, particularly if we bring them in as mission aircraft, uh, we've had 10 added in the last two years. If another 10 were to be added, the bill for the fight up for the Air Force to bring those aircraft in would be nearly a billion dollars. So there is a balance here that we need to strike with other Air Force priorities. Uh, and uh, this, this is not where we would put incremental investment dollars. There are lots of other higher priority things. This is just not it. We, we're not unappreciative, uh, and, and we understand your perspective. I've heard you say that uh, combat search and rescue is a moral imperative. We don't disagree with that. We just don't think it's going to be done in the highly contested environment with H.A. Sissy Whiskies. Okay. Thank you. Senator Cotton. I've got uh, one more um, question here. I want to talk a little bit about uh, the CCA program a little bit further. Uh, what do you expect the, the um, first delivery of a collaborative combat aircraft that's operational? So what we are anticipating is operational units ready to operate in the later 2020s uh, with production aircraft that are delivered and ready for operations. Have you given any thought to, as we go and you know fly training missions with pilots uh, in NGAD, um, certainly there will be times that you would want a full up complement of how, however many CCA um, aircraft would be in whatever the strike package would look like. I mean, that certainly does make sense. But from a cost perspective, you got to also maybe see a scenario where you could fly NGAD without, in a training environment, without the associated CCA and the same time simulate them. Is that, is that part of the program? It was just something I was thinking about today as uh, I think it was uh, Senator Peters was asking his questions that you would have in, within the airplane itself, within NGAD, have some kind of simulation mode so you're communicating with you know, some CCAs, but they're actually not really out there. There is absolutely uh, a plan to do to have that as a capability that CCAs will be able to contribute. We talked about the joint simulation environment. We need to have uh, CCAs represented in that. That is absolutely part of our plan. Uh, and as you suggest, Senator, the way in which one trains with the CCA could look very different from uh, you know from the traditional training because uh, the capabilities, what the pilot has to do to interact with the CCA uh, in operations, they may not actually see those aircraft. Uh, it may not be within visual range. So, uh, so uh, it is potentially going to look different from what we're used to, uh, and we are thinking that through as we, uh, as we work into the CCA capability and with the experimentation that the experimental operations unit is going to be doing, thinking through those issues. How does it work best, not just for operations, but also for training and sustainment? This is a uh, technological leap uh, that we're about to take here. And to get there, we're going to have to divest some systems that today can deliver ordnance on target. Um, I'm all for innovation. And, uh, you know, I think we have to, it's one of the things we do well as a country, and I think we have to out-innovate our adversaries. Um, but do you, do you worry about maybe we get to a certain point and realize this is not going to work as well as we thought, and then we went too far down the road? and we've divested of uh, certain capabilities, or are you starting to feel, and I know there's been some simulation done on this, some testing, are you starting to feel as if we're going to get there and we can, we can make this work? I have a very high confidence that the CCA capability will be a significant increase in our overall capability. Uh, but I, I think to your point, uh, we will learn how to best use these assets and what exactly they can and cannot do. But let me defer to General Spain on, on that. Yeah, Senator Kelly, operationally, the CCA program, as it's uh, currently moving down its path, uh, 
gets us to a place where some of the risks that we're taking with manned platforms can be mitigated to a degree uh, in uh, l less survivable platforms uh, down the road in highly contested environments. What we're, the other par part of this that we're doing as pathfinders is in the training environment. Uh, and so from an undergraduate pilot training perspective, we're pursuing augmented reality technology, uh, um, uh, uh, artificial intelligence technology that can be embedded into, into the synthetic environment, potentially in the joint sim simulated environment uh, specifically, uh, to enable this capability down the road and enable the ability to train with it at a high end uh, in a relevant environment that, to your point earlier, uh, allows our air crew to ring out the systems, both the systems and their tactics, techniques, and procedures uh, in a relevant environment that we can no longer emulate in live fly. And so we'll, we'll have elements that are uh, preserved for live flying that we still need to uh, train to and, and put pressure on, on, uh, on humans in cockpits to be able to do that and get to the skill sets required in those mission areas from a cockpit. Uh, the better we can and the more we can bring this technology down the road to create synthetic uh, targets that they're flying against where the TTPs are not observable out in live fly, the, the better off that we'll all be. All right, thank you, General. Any, anything further anybody would like to share? Anything you feel we need to know? All right, well, thank you, Senator Cotton. Anything else? Okay, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>